Okay, hi everyone, and welcome back. Um, I hope you took a few minutes to catch your breath before the second half of our EL PFDD meeting about pemphigus and pemphigoid. Uh, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, I'm Patrick Dunn, the Executive Director of the IPPF. Uh, before the break, we focused on what these diseases are, as well as the current treatment options and their limitations. We also learned why the FDA places such a high value on these meetings. Most importantly, we heard directly from people living with pemphigus and pemphigoid about the ways in which these diseases have drastically impacted their lives. Coming up, we'll focus on the need for greater awareness of these diseases in order to improve treatment options, and we'll discuss how the clinical trial experience can produce meaningful benefits for patients. We will also hear from patients about their perspective on current treatments and associated side effects. I'll now pass things over to Becky so she can introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Patrick. Before I introduce our next distinguished speaker, I encourage you to participate in the first poll question of the session about how your current treatment affects the most significant symptoms of your disease. So our next speaker is Professor Dede Morell, MD, who will be discussing the lack of healthcare treatments, awareness, and education regarding blistering diseases. Professor Morell, Dede Morell is chair of the Department of Dermatology at St. George Hospital, University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She completed her medical training at Cambridge and Oxford Universities, three years of internal medicine in the UK and USA, Dermatology training at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a fellowship in dermatopharmacology at Duke, blistering diseases and cell biology at New York University, and then became a, clin a clinical scholar at Rockefeller University. She holds a doctorate on pathogenesis of blistering disorders, her main subspecialty interest, and her current research focuses on the development and validation of clinical outcome measures for autoimmune blistering diseases and epidermolysis bullosa to enable clinical trials to proceed in these orphan diseases. She has over 375 peer-reviewed papers, 16,000 citations, an age index of 61, and has edited six books, including textbooks on blistering diseases. She lecture, lectures at international congresses regularly and is a visiting professor in five continents. She established Australia's first dedicated dermatology clinical trial center and is, and is a key opinion leader in trial design and conduct, serving on numerous advisory boards for more than 20 years. Her group established the ABQUAL TABQUAL for measuring quality of life in autoimmune blistering diseases, and she co-led the development and validation of the Pemphigus Disease Area Index, Bullis Pemphigoid Disease Area Index, and Mucous Membrane Pemphigoid Disease Area Index. She established the, and also established the Australian Blistering Disease Foundation in 2006. Welcome, Professor Morell. Thank you very much, Becky and Patrick, for that amazing, um, very flattering introduction. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Here we go. Uh, it was very, uh, it's six o'clock in the morning here in Sydney. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, and it's a pleasure to be joining you. Um, I just joined and heard some of the patients expressing extremely well uh, what the frustrations are like as a person suffering from these autoimmune blistering diseases. My task in the next 15 minutes is to talk to you about the lack of treatments, lack of awareness, and lack of education regarding these rare autoimmune blistering diseases. These are my disclosures, many of which you just mentioned. This is where I'm speaking to you from, just across the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Now, these diseases, um, as you will be aware, are rare, but potentially fatal. And among uh, dermatologic diseases, apart from melanoma, uh, these and epidermolysis bullosa are the diseases that we're dealing with, which can kill our patients. They're not just, as the last patient mentioned, just a little skin disease. Uh, these diseases attack and destroy the skin as well as the internal mucous membranes. And we uh, clinicians have divided them up into these uh, confusing Greek names, uh, pemphigus and pemphigoid. And pemphigus um, isn't just one or two little blisters on the skin. 
it can extremely uh, disfigure the patient as well as cause much pain. The pemphigus is in the outer part of the skin, but can involve the outer parts of the mucous membranes as well. Whilst the pemphigoid, if you like to think of it as one ending in D because it's deep and one ending in S because it's superficial. Uh, the deeper ones uh, usually involve the mucous membranes or they attack the skin in a very widespread sense with deep blisters as the last patient nicely showed in her presentation. And the deeper ones can also involve some that cause significant scarring, such as the mucous membrane pemphigoid, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita called EBA for short, and linear IgA dermatosis or LAD for short. So starting with the two main ones, the pemphigus, it's a disease which, whilst in the United States and here in Australia is relatively rare, is a disease which occurs along the old trading routes of the Silk Road, meaning from China through the Middle East all the way to the old port of Venice. And so people who are from those countries uh, get this disease uh, probably because of various genetic predispositions as well as potentially some environmental triggers. And they have since migrated all over the world uh, so it involves Jewish patients, uh, Islamic patients who've moved from Iran, from India, um, right along that part of the world to the rest of the world. And a lot of my patients in my clinics are migrants who've moved to Australia and now Australians, or even people from Italy, from Greece, from Turkey, uh, people who may not even realize that they have ancestry from this part of the world. The commonest part of this pemphigus is called pemphigus vulgaris, and a less common one, but which is endemic in certain countries, is pemphigus foliaceus. And whilst the disease attacks people of working age, it can also attack uh, children and also even neonates born to mothers with pemphigus. The disease, as uh, shown here and with permission of one of my patients, is very severe, especially if not recognised, which is quite common because of its rarity, and still to this day has a mortality of up to 10. 10%. Without the dreaded steroids, the mortality used to be 90%. And nowadays, many patients are dying from complications of this treatment. Because until recently, when rituximab was approved as the first FDA approved treatment, uh, and in many countries around the world, it still isn't officially approved or available. Uh, the patients are treated with high dose steroids to try to get this aggressive disease under control with or without other steroid sparing drugs which carry side effects. And the treatment lasts for at least two years, if not up to 10 years, if not longer. Two of the main problems in managing our patients is one common problem that the disease relapses. And this is why patients end up having to have longer term cumulative doses of steroids, and therefore more side effects as mentioned by the last patient suffering from diabetes or a rarer problem, recalcitrant pemphigus, which doesn't even respond to these very high doses of steroids. And in the past, those were the group of patients which we were giving higher doses of immunosuppressive drugs to intravenous immunoglobulin or rituximab. Um, but as you'll see soon, the management is starting to improve. Then in the uh, other disease, the deep uh, blistering disease category, we have uh, the more common disease, bullous pemphigoid, and we have this uh, awful disease, mucous membrane pemphigoid, which can cause blindness. And because it's quite insidious in onset, often optometrists and ophthalmologists even don't realize uh, that the patient has such a severe disease and are giving them eye drops, and gradually the patient's eyes are becoming scarred irreversibly. It can attack the mouth. It can go down the larynx and cause a hoarse voice and cough, uh, the esophagus and give rise to difficulty swallowing and excuse the photographs, but uh, some of these patients can have very painful involvement of their genitalia and anal areas. So as to the treatments, um, we need better treatments just like uh, other diseases in medicine, but because steroids have been so cheap and cheerful and easy for doctors to prescribe, um, they have been the mainstay of treatment. And despite us getting together for our meetings, um, there has been no international consensus or agreement on how to use these steroids. And it's been mainly based on clinical experience in different countries. 
but often patients are given one to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. And in the Middle East, where they say these diseases are more severe, they're often given higher doses than that. It's then given continuously, which can be for many weeks until these diseases uh, stop developing new blisters. And then the, the prednisone needs to be slowly tapered because otherwise, if you just give them a taper that doctors are used to giving for allergies over three weeks, the poor patient keeps relapsing. As a result of this, while successful in controlling the disease, uh, the poor patient is developing many side effects, including weight gain, type two diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, a moon face and other uh, bad side effects. Invisible side effects uh, can include wasting of the bones, leading to osteoporosis, falls and fractures. Uh, another uh, significant side effect is infections because the patient is becoming immunosuppressed with this treatment and at the same time more sugary and attractive to bugs. One of the problems with the skin is that the infections can look like the primary disease that the doctor is treating. So unless the doctor is very experienced, they wouldn't recognize that this disease here was an infection rather than a relapse of the patient's pemphigus. And it can cause blisters in the mouth with herpes and higher doses of immunosuppressants would then allow that infection to spread. Even little tiny pustules on the skin can be something as significant as an ocardio cryptococcus something which can cause then meningitis or severe lung disease. These steroid side effects are associated with older age, something which our patients have when they develop these diseases. Higher initial doses which are required to control the disease and guess what? Control prolonged administration which uh, we have to do or else the disease relapses. Quite some time ago, I got together with a team of likewise interested people, including uh, the previous founder of the IPPF and Vicki Worth, who will be speaking after me from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, to evaluate the literature in an evidence-based fashion using the Cochrane collaboration format. It was quite shocking to realize that at that time, around 2006, there were only 11 randomized control trials conducted in pemphigus, none of which were sponsored by a pharma, and only of just over 400 patients included in these trials. It wasn't until Pascal Jolie's group in France, the group Boulle independently, separate from pharma, uh, created uh, this publication, which has been uh, pivotal in the change of management for pemphigus, and it was published in The Lancet in 2017. Uh, they were the first to observe and publish in the New England Journal of Medicine that rituximab uh, could re result in long-term uh, suppression of the disease. And they decided to do this randomized pivotal trial uh, in new pa patients with new onset pemphigus vulgaris. And they were randomized to the standard treatment of one to 1.5 milligram per kilo per day of prednisone tapered over the usual 12 to 18 months versus the new protocol of giving the patients infusions of rituximab 1,000 milligrams twice, day zero and day 14, along with half the dose of 0.5 or one milligram per kilo, depending on disease extent, for only three to six months. And their primary endpoint was the rate of complete remission, i.e. no more blisters for at least eight weeks, off therapy, meaning, of course, not off rituximab because that has a long lasting tail effect, but off steroid therapy at two years. The study randomized 90 patients, half half to each group. And at two years, the rates of complete remission off therapy were almost 90% in the patients given the rituximab plus lower dose steroids versus only a third of the patients on the standard treatment used around the world. The cumulative duration of the complete remission off, st off steroids was seven times longer, 400 and almost 50 days in the rituximab group compared to only around two months in the standard treatment group. And the cumulative dose of prednisone was only one third of the total dose in the rituximab arm with half the side effects of the other group. So in conclusion, giving patients first line rituximab instead of waiting to see if they were recalcitrant or chronic remitters with short-term steroids in pemphigus was more effective than the standard treatment being used of steroids, plus or minus other things, 
It gives a great uh, majority of steroid sparing effect and fewer side effects. We do have some disadvantages of rituximab, one of which is that it takes three to four months before it becomes active. Therefore, these patients still need high dose steroids or relatively high dose steroids up to one milligram per kilo per day until then. And then the tapering takes at least three to six months because of the delay in onset of action of rituximab. The other issue is that rituximab, once it works, can last for six to 12 months, which was a problem during the COVID-19 pandemic because many of these patients have already received rituximab, which causes long-term B cell and antibody suppression. And in two countries where this was studied, France and Iran, they have published that those patients had a five times increased mortality from COVID before the vaccines were available over the conventional therapies. Therefore, it would be good to have a drug with the effects of rituximab, but which perhaps was reversible, reducing the antibodies, but which could be given continuously instead of once that would last for such a long time. Because the drug was developed for cancer where you do want to suppress patients with hematological malignancies long-term, uh, rather than a disease where you might want to switch off the treatment for safety reasons. So therefore having a faster acting and reversible treatment for this disease uh, would be uh, of advantage. So currently in trials, uh, the landscape is changing. We have a number of these types of drugs currently in trial or have been recently trialed for pemphigus. One promising drug was a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor called rilzabrutinib. Uh, that drug um, was in trial, but the primary endpoint uh, was changed at some point uh, which, uh, which, which meant that the phase three trial uh, ended up without a significant difference. Um, there are several FCRN inhibitors in trial, including Fgartigimod in a phase three trial. And interestingly, excitingly, at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Amy Payne is in uh, the process of developing and studying a CAR T therapy uh, for pemphigus. For bullous pemphigoid, we have dupilumab approved for children for eczema, a very safe treatment, currently in phase three trials for bullous pemphigoid. We have the FCRN inhibitors, which reversibly inhibit the antibodies, a couple of them in phase two, three trials. And we've had a trial of something which blocks eataxin one, which causes itching and blistering in bullous pemphigoid so far just to a phase two trial. So it's very exciting that this is happening. But we need the FDA to understand these definitions and endpoints that are being used in these trials. For example, of course, we would like to have complete rather than partial remissions where the blisters have completely gone away. And we have two types of these remissions. One, which is off therapy, which meant when we developed all this, of course, off the dreaded steroid therapy. And we need for it to be at least eight weeks in duration, if not longer. Uh, but eight weeks was felt um, sufficient period of time to show that that off steroids had truly been off the steroids. Of course, we never envisioned that this meant off the new therapy that was being tested, because as you can see with the publication on rituximab, the patients were still on the therapy because of the long-term tail that that therapy had, um, you, whereas other reversible therapies that might be, say, weekly injections, or monthly injections or fortnightly injections, uh, which are reversible and can't be ceased, would still be expected to be under testing against a placebo of that therapy, but the patients would be off the therapy, which causes the most side effects, the steroids. Or the trial could look at minimal therapy of steroids, and that was defined as steroid doses under 10 milligrams per day of prednisone, but of course, for some little patients who don't weigh very much, 10 milligrams of prednisone is still a significant dose for those patients. So it could be listed as milligram per kilo in a lower format, uh, that it was equivalent to this, or for example, five milligrams of prednisone, which is practically physiological doses. And because some patients have been so steroid dependent for many years, you cannot always stop their uh, steroid therapies. And so minimal doses of therapies, we feel in some instances is also a significant improvement in managing the disease. And then we have definitions of what constitutes flares. We also have been in the process of measuring um, and validating objective endpoints. 
and uh, the disease measurements that we've developed and validated that are the most valid in, in studies around the world have been the PDAI score or PDI score developed by the International Pemphigus Group. It's been uh, compared in a few different studies now against some other uh, validated endpoints, including the PVAS, which was developed and used in Iran, and the ABSIS score, uh, which is de developed and validated in Germany. And the studies have shown that of those three, the one which has the highest inter-rater reliability, they're all good for one doctor rescoring the patient, the same doctor again. Uh, but in reality, patients are seen by different doctors on different days, and the doctors can't always be the same doctor. So that's why this score, the PDI score, uh, is the most used in the trials. Similarly, uh, we developed another score for bullous pemphigoid called BPDAI, and that has also been shown to be much more valid and reliable with these uh, important measurements. Uh, FDA is very uh, used to scoring skin diseases with something called an Investigator Global Assessment Score, IGA, where patients are scored out of zero to four, five different points, and where four is severe and zero is clear. Uh, most of those studies require the patients to go from a three or a four, meaning a moderate to severe, down to a zero or a one. Sometimes they're allowed to go to a two. Uh, it can be very tricky to score diseases that have such wide manifestations and severities uh, in such a simplistic scoring system. Uh, patients with these diseases are often very happy to get from what would be considered severe down to something which would be moderate, uh, especially in diseases such as psoriasis, which I also do trials on, uh, disease, drugs that were developed for those diseases and drugs which are now approved for eczema have only to improve by 50% or 75% on these types of scoring systems to be considered to be successful drugs. So we are in the process of seeing whether IGA scores can truly be as reliable and valid as these other highly validated scores, but we have studied something very similar on a zero to 10 scale called physician global assessment in these studies. And they were found to be far less reliable than these disease scoring uh, tools. These tools that we have are very good at measuring both skin and mucous membranes and the validation that they have in something called the Cosmin analysis system, which is internationally recognized are far better than those developed for psoriasis called PASI and eczema called EASY, which have been developed and are approved and used uh, by the FDA. So we would appreciate consideration of these trial scores in our studies. The other thing is the lack of awareness about these diseases, which was touched on by our most recent patient. Because these diseases are rare, people don't appreciate what they are. Uh, the patients, and we studied and published on this, are highly stigmatized, as the patient was saying, that people assume it's infectious, walk away from the patient. Patients are scared to go outside for comments that they receive. The other problem is delay in diagnosis, because when something starts in the mouth, the patient goes off to the dentist, and many dentists have last heard of these diseases when they were in dental school, and they think it's gingivitis, and it can be a long time before the penny drops and they get to any uh, doctors or specialists who might recognize it. The other problem is if it starts on the face is even dermatologists think that this is a skin cancer uh, because they're used to seeing crusty lesions on the face of being skin cancers and might proceed to cut that whole thing out, put a skin graft on it before it relapses, and then they think, oh, maybe it's something else. Uh, or as you can see, this poor lady here is quite young, um, who's got alopecia and this pustular disease, which is sort of pemphigus in her scalp, pemphigus foliaceus, the so-called mild form of pemphigus. Uh -uh. And you can imagine being 21 years old and having to go around looking like that. Uh, the patients, um, once they know they have the diseases, might find there's only one or two centers in their country where there are doctors specializing in the disease, so that's a problem for them getting travel to these centers. We're lucky in Australia that the government funds travel for patients with rare diseases who have to get to such centers. Other studies we've done uh, about the loss of jobs and income, especially in working age patients or young people who get these diseases can be very difficult because they can't go to work or they, or they get stigmatized going to work and it affects their quality of life, which we can measure 
scientifically and document. And then, of course, there's the complications of treatment requirements to go into take days off work to go for infusions. So even if the patient looks normal, they got to explain to someone why they have to take the day off to go to a hospital, for example, for a rituximab infusion. When wouldn't it be nice if they could just self inject themselves with something into their tummy at home like people do with tupilumab or other treatments. And so we need more education, both for physicians and dentists and medical students and people in the community to understand these diseases. So here's some examples of things which could easily be and have been mistaken for infections when this is pemphigus foliaceus. Um, patients undergoing cancer treatments. This patient of mine had laryngeal cancer and he'd had surgery, a laryngectomy and was receiving radiotherapy to stop the tumor from spreading. And this developed and they thought for ages that it was an infection, gave him numerous antibiotics, but it was uh, radiation induced pemphigus. It went not only on his skin, but right in his mouth and down his throat, which they kept thinking was his cancer coming back. Rituximab saves that patient. Uh, pemphigus foliaceus, which as we as dermatologists get frustrated that both pharma and other authorities uh, only want to license the treatments for pemphigus foliaceus purely because it occurs in the mouth, usually that that's so-called the severe disease. Whereas we encounter these patients with this disease uh, causing alopecia, being on the face where the patient can't hide the disease or spreading all over the skin where the poor patient has turned up at emergency only to be told you've got dirty skin, go home and have a wash or being told it's psoriasis and put you in a light box and it's known that UV light flares up the disease. We also have these patients who may have what appears to be limited extent disease, but which causes severe scars. And this is one of these rarer diseases called epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. And this often attacks the eyes, the throat, the genitalia and internal organs, as well as the skin. So what's been fortunate by us being able to get together uh, at our own uh, cost initially and now more and more thankfully enabled by pharma is that those of us who are passionate about these diseases and these patients are growing steadily and have been able thanks to the IPPF to get together um, because we, need, we needed these uniform outcome measures. We needed these validated scoring systems to proceed. We've been able to publish these monographs together that bring out more awareness of the disease. Uh, we've published clinical cases together. We've published books that comprehensively look at the causes, the clinical manifestations, how to measure the diseases and how to treat the diseases. So there's more awareness, uh, but we do need your help. And we appreciate so much the FDA being interested today in listening to us to improve the awareness of the disease severity. Uh, to use our validated disease specific measurements that we've spent the last 15 years developing and validating uh, without assistance from pharma. Um, and these can develop, uh, these can measure scientifically the disease severity of the disease and the responses to the treatment better than IGA scores, in my humble opinion. With these disease scores can uh, separate the disease activity, which is reversible from the scarring damage. Uh, which is left behind by these diseases and which we think new drugs will not be able to in influence and IGA scores may include that damage and make it more difficult for us to demonstrate that our treatments are working for these diseases and patients. And we need um, FDA to listen to us about these complete remissions or partial remissions on different doses of minimal steroid therapy or hopefully without steroids, but with our new therapies that are under clinical trials. So I'll close there and hope I haven't run over and be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Morell, for highlighting the lack of treatments, awareness and education in autoimmune bullous diseases. At this time, I'm gonna ask uh, our community to take a moment to respond to our next poll. <clears throat> so um, as Dr. Morell's presentation really emphasized, these diseases are not taken seriously at all. And uh, together, we really must leverage the data that we have about these diseases to create awareness and education around the lack of treatment options for patients. 
We've heard that these diseases can, can be potentially fatal and that the mortality rate can be as high as 10%. Uh, these disease, uh, the disease has a habit of relapsing uh, and some patients uh, may never even respond to treatments. The treatment side effects can cause infections uh, and most cause delays in patients improvement leading to poor quality of life. Along with validated measures, our patient experiences will help inform researchers about the physical and psychological impacts of these conditions to help guide investigations into new treatments. Thank you again, Dr. Morell, and we're gonna move on to our next speaker, and I'm gonna bring back uh, Becky to, uh, to introduce her. Thanks, Mark. Before I introduce our next disease expert, I encourage you to participate in our next trial about how many different medications you take for your disease. All right. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Victoria Wirth. Dr. Wirth received her medical degree from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, followed by residency and postdoctoral research fellowship in immunodermatology at New York University. Dr. Wirth moved to Penn in 1989 as Chief of Dermatology at the Philadelphia VA Hospital. At Penn, she directs the Autoimmune Skin Disease Study Unit and performs clinical and translational research studies in autoimmune skin diseases funded by NIH, autoimmune foundations, and industry. She has performed a number of industry trials for Pemphigus and Bullis pemphigoid. She has a basic research lab at the VA devoted to autoimmune skin disease and photobiology funded by the National Institute of Health and the VA. Dr. Wirth's clinical practice specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of patients with autoimmune skin diseases, including autoimmune blistering diseases, lupus erythematosus, and dermatomyositis. She led an international effort to develop disease severity tools for several autoimmune blistering diseases, including pemphigus and bullous pemphigoid. These tools are now used in international trials that are, are used in developing new drugs for autoimmune blistering diseases, including uh, the trial leading to the recent FDA approval of rituximab for pemphigus vulgaris. Dr. Wirth has also performed studies to determine the impact of bullous diseases on quality of life. Her research laboratory has determined the heterogeneity of the inflammatory cell infiltrate in skin in photo-induced autoimmune skin diseases and correlates this with the response to therapy. Uh, her laboratory has also performed translational research to better understand how novel therapies that modulate inflammatory cells work in autoimmune skin diseases. She has been on the Met IPPF Medical Advisory Board since the beginning of the foundation. Dr. Worth has received numerous honors for her work, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Medical Dermatology Society, the Rose Herschler Award from the Women's Dermatologic Society and the American Skin Association's Research Achievement Award in Autoimmune and Inflammatory Skin Disorders, the Lifetime Career Educator Award from the Dermatology Foundation, and the Naomi Kanoff Clinical Investigator Award from the Society of Investigative Dermatology. Welcome, Dr. Worth. Thank you very much, and it's great to be here. Uh, and I would like to try to share my screen. <laughs> Hopefully you can see my slides. Let's see. All right, so today I have, a, uh, I think, a great opportunity to share uh, some of our clinical trial experience and also to discuss uh, meaningful benefits to patients. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak uh, with the FDA and to have heard the uh, voices of the patients, which I think is really so critical. I'm gonna talk a little bit about def the definitions of endpoints and you heard from Dr. Morell, uh, a lot of work has gone into thinking about this uh, over many years. Also about some uh, insights based on clinical trial experience, uh, what, how to think about meaningful improvement from a physician and a patient and more importantly patient perspective. And then also the role of investigative level assessments for rare autoimmune skin diseases, such as pemphigus or pemphigoid. So, um, first, the definitions. So you can see our work began uh, around 2008. We published uh, a paper about consensus statement on definitions of disease endpoints and therapeutic response. And we've continued to work uh, since that time on pemphigoid, on issues around management, 
um, and there's continuing efforts in this regards. So one of the points to make, however, is that much of this work was done prior to any clinical trials in pemphigus. It's really a very uh, rather new um, event that people are becoming more interested in trying to improve therapies, and we're very excited about that. These definitions were based on just standard of care, steroids, immunosuppressives, and how do we define what we're seeing in our patients. And so complete remission off therapy was absence of new or established lesions while off all systemic therapy for at least two months. And I think to point out that the genesis of this was not in the context of a trial, thinking that we're going to get people off of a trial drug when we're trying to assess um, the therapy. Um, and so I think that's one of the things to put the uh, these uh, important endpoints into context that they are really about standard of care, not about necessarily trying to dictate endpoints for clinical trials. And then also complete remission on therapy, absence of new or established lesions while minimal therapy for at least two months. And we've had a chance as these trials go, trials go on to think a lot more about what this minimal therapy actually means. And then partial remission off therapy is just presence of transient new lesions that heal within a week without treatment. And this speaks to the idea that getting to clear, almost clear, when we really thought that a partial remission was even just some transient lesions, which are really not so bothersome to patients, uh, that needs to be considered when we're thinking about endpoints for trials, uh, and because a transient tra lesion may be actually at fine from a patient perspective. And then partial remission on minimal therapy. So what I wanted to talk about is some of the efforts that the international group have made to refine endpoints uh, in particular around, and I think Dr. Morrell has already alluded to some of this, but the definition of minimal therapy is vis-a-vis -vis steroids and also adjunctive therapies. And also to make the point that newer therapies have different mechanisms that may make their biologic half-life quite different and require refined definitions uh, based on that, the mechanism of action. And then also that defining meaningful improvement is really critical to uh, making sure we can develop drugs that are beneficial to patients. So in the original guidelines, minimal therapy would have been less than or equal to 10 milligrams per day. And this is independent of body weight. And now as, as Dr. Morrell mentioned, better to say less than 0.1 mg per kilo per day. Again, international consensus about this. And in the context of a clinical trial, and I'll show you some examples of these, uh, you know, there may be uh, benefits even um, thinking about this in different ways. Uh, and in particular, tapering off of steroids. Uh, so steroids have an effect on disease activity, but um, the goal is steroid sparing, given its side effects that we've heard about eloquently today. And then for adjunctive therapies, the definition of minimal adjunctive therapy does not uh, clearly defined the doses of these treatments are either effective or ineffective. And so we have to put that in the context as well now that we're doing studies. And then also, the, um, again, the idea that newer therapies have different mechanisms of actions and different biologic half-lives. So I want to speak about some of these uh, in, in the context of a couple of clinical trials, one of them being the uh, Rosilbra-Dudnip, the Pegasus trial, and another being the Rituximab trial, just to talk about potential ways of thinking about complete response, whether it be on low doses of steroids or off treatment, as was uh, talked about with the rituximab trials. And then the design of the primary outcome, again, the idea being that the mechanism, for instance, with rituximab is that um, the last infusion was performed six months before the assessment of the primary endpoint, but the effects on B cells last longer than six months. So in fact, the patient had a biologic effect uh, or the patients had biologic effects uh, at a one-year uh, uh, point, time point, even though their last dose was six months previously. And other medications with a shorter half-life need to be continued to the endpoint to see the steroid-sparing effects. And they can't be stopped because then you lose the effect of the drug. So in the Pegasus trial, there were some good examples, I think, of, um, of helpful trial designs. It's a short-acting drug, so they got uh, were able to give the drug to the primary endpoint, uh, meaning the drug was allowed to be effective and to measure that endpoint. Uh, the complete remission was, uh, was defined initially as less than or equal to five minutes per day, which I think would have been very helpful because as we know from many autoimmune trials at higher doses of steroids, you can have a higher placebo effect and it's very hard to see um, sometimes separate um, the curves of a placebo versus a drug. And so being able to uh, not mandate or allow a higher dose for an outcome uh, might be actually quite important here. 
uh, in separating the treatment from placebo groups. And then lastly, it's helpful to have steroid reduction built into the protocol, which is what was done here with the steroid taper over the course of the, of the protocol, and then uh, the uh, primary endpoint here. So to show what can happen in terms of the pharmaco, uh, uh, kinetics and pharmacodynamics, it's important to look at the differences with, with rituximab, for instance, where you can see in blue getting the drug, there's lots of drug, but then it's cleared over the course of uh, you know, two to four months, it's down to 120 days, it's down to nothing. But look at the B cells in orange, they're all the way down and they stay down throughout the whole time of the study, including the fact that the second dose of rituximab is here, you can see that the dose of the drug comes up again, it's cleared, but you have a PD, a pharmacodynamic effect, biologic effect that's persisting. So the design of a trial with a drug like this is going to have to be take that into account. However, if you look at F, uh, gardicamide, which is a, a CRN antibody, blocks the receptor. Here, you can see each of these spike series when they're getting a good drug, and then it's rapidly cleared. And you can really see this in the fact that um, when the PK, again, the pharmacokinetics, uh, very rapidly you lose um, the drug as when you stop getting the drug. And similarly, the form of the dynamics, the biologic effect reverses, it goes away very, very quickly. So if you have to stop the drug here and wait two or three months to get an endpoint, you're not gonna see the drug effect because it's gone. Here, it's still here. So it's important to think about that as we design our trials um, and think about uh, whether the drug can be continued in order to see effects. Now in the PEMPIT study, uh, which was a very interesting study, the patients had severe PEMPIGUS, they were on a lot of prednisone, and they either got uh, rituximab and then uh, placebo that included um, um, CELSEF, mycophenolate mofetil, or the reverse where uh, the, and here they got a dummy, rituximab patients got a dummy MMF, and here a dummy rituximab. So it was a double, what's called a double blind, double dummy active comparator superiority trial. And you can see the last dose was here at uh, day 168, and then uh, the second dose at day 182, and the endpoints at week 52. And here you can see the tapering of the steroids, which again is extremely important. So what happened? So the complete response rate was, you can see here after the first infusion, it was probably around 30%, and then after the second, it was around 40%, and that was sustained to the end of the trial at week 52. If you look at um, the placebo arm, clearly um, there was not much of a, a complete response and uh, or complete remission. And so this was a helpful study to get an idea of how many patients can accomplish uh, a, a sustained complete remission. And this is just a different way of showing 40% versus 9.5% for the um, placebo MMF treated group. Well, what about the B cells in this particular study? So that's uh, right here in blue. You can see they came down quickly and they stayed down for the whole year. And, uh, and so basically, uh, and this is looking at the B cells uh, that you know, did not decrease to nearly the same extent in the control placebo arm. So again, the biologic effects persist. So it becomes important, I think, to think about meaningful improvement in this context. And so, as I showed you, 40% of the patients um, had the sustained remission endpoint. Well, what about, the, what did the clinicians think? What was the clinician global impression of change from baseline to week 52? And here, you can see that 87.2% of the clinicians thought that the patients were very much improved relative to 57.1% in the placebo group. So that's a, a significant difference. And also to point out uh, that it's much higher than the 40% sustained complete remission. So uh, the physicians were happy. Well, what about the patients? Well, 80.9% thought they were very much improved as well. And uh, in the control group, the 39.3% thought they were very much improved. So again, a very big difference between the treatment arm and the um, placebo arm at this particular trial. So when we think about meaningful improvement, what we're showing here is that um, both from a clinician perspective with 87.2% with rituximab versus 57.1% on placebo, uh, feeling uh, uh, greatly improved. Uh, if, and from a patient perspective, similarly, there, there's a, a, a quite a big improvement, even though only 40% of patients had sustained complete remission off treatment. But again, pointing out that they still had the biologic effect of the drug. And therefore, patients felt very much improved despite not having sustained complete response. And I think this um, speaks to the importance of having an endpoint that can really correlate 
um, with the patient perspective. Here's another study that by uh, looking at Pemphigus uh, with the PDAI, and you can see that these are patients who um, you know, still have uh, blisters and erosions here because they're not zero. They're, they're in the, uh, they still have you know, real disease, but their quality of life scores are really clustered um, low for many patients. And um, this is considered to be that they're, they're really in a very good place that they very rarely are bothered by their disease. In this study where they looked at the P BP guy, uh, and that's an outcome measure for bolus pemphigoid uh, that Dr. Morell and I and many of the international uh, uh, members worked on this very carefully. What you can see is that in this uh, another nomocopan trial that um, there was a, a significant change in the score activity for bolus pemphigoid that correlated with a similar change in the DLQI, another measure of skin specific quality of life. And I'll point out that uh, patients, for instance, who had 75% improvement in the BP dye had nearly complete improvement in the DLQI, so, or 100% you know, improvement. So I think that um, it really speaks to the idea that you can have be much better, um, but not completely better, and be able to be much happier in terms of the disease control. So that brings me to the uh, IGA, the Investigator Global Assessment, and for um, bolus pemphigoid, uh, the one that's been developed and again, not really validated or uh, in any way gone through the kinds of testing that has been done over the last 15 years with the other instruments that are really drilling down on the disease activity. Um, what you can appreciate is that clear means no blisters and erosions and no erythema, no eczematous lesions, no urticarial lesions, and that makes sense. But almost clear, the only thing you can have is faint erythema. So none of the blisters or erosions, which are the typical findings that you might expect, uh, and no eczema and no urticaria, urticarial lesions. So essentially, you have to have no active lesions to be called almost clear. And very often in these studies, you need to get to clear almost clear in order to be uh, called a success. There's evidence that patients are much happier, even if not clear or almost clear, uh, meaning no activity. And, uh, and this makes achieving an IgA response difficult and not tied to the meaningful response for patients. This problem exists for many autoimmune skin diseases where an IgA response is insensitive and not correlating with meaningful response as assessed by either physicians or patients. And this is impeding new drug development that is clearly needed for our autoimmune blistering diseases. So in summary, the definitions of outcomes has been refined for steroid dose and minimal adjuvant therapy. Uh, there, it informs important trial design issues, including needing to maintain drug intervention up to the time of the endpoint for drugs with short biologic effects. This is very similar to rheumatologic trials and autoimmune diseases that don't require stopping the treatment months before the endpoint. And the goal is assessing drug effects on the disease activity, steroid sparing effect, and quality of life. It, the clearance of lesions is not required for great improvement in quality of life that's meaningful for patients. And non-validated and insensitive IgAs don't correlate with meaningful responses or, and are impeding drug development. I appreciate the opportunity to present the data that has been generated by these early trials in autoimmune blistering disease and really look forward to further advances in the field. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wirth, uh, for your presentation on clinical trial experience and meaningful benefit. Um, before we share some patient perspective videos regarding available treatments for your diseases uh, and their side effects and how to improve them, uh, let's launch another quick poll. And uh, as Dr. Wirth illustrated, the term remission uh, has multiple definitions for these complex, life-threatening, serious diseases. Also, as new therapies are developed and we learn more about these diseases, it is important to refine these definitions so that they have meaningful impact and improvements on patients' lives. Due to treatment side effects, minimal therapy is often considered effective and is the primary goal in the minds of patients. The long term, while well, the long term goal of complete remission being secondary, because steroids have such a profound effect on people's daily lives, therapies that are steroid sparing are preferred and are of the primary concern of patients. We have heard that treatments like rituximab take a while to take effect, and these are prolonged and have 
uh, and there are prolonged effects over time. Yet, only 40% had uh, sustained complete remission off treatment, and patients felt that they felt very much improved despite not, not having sustained complete remission. This illustrates that therapies don't have to be perfect. They just need to provide meaningful benefit to the person's quality of life. We have sensitive, validated assessments and measurement tools that already demonstrate this. So any new tools need to take uh, the patient's perspective on what's most important to them into account. We'll now share some patient perspective videos regarding their disease treatments, their side effects, and how they can be improved. Hi, my name is Christina Bruno, and I was diagnosed with Fembigus oligus. I'll never say it right, so excuse me. Um, I am. I was diagnosed when I was 37 years old um, in October or September of 2021. Um, when I was diagnosed, it took about five different doctors, a rheumatologist, dental uh, doctors, to tell me I had all these other things, but no one told me I had. I'll call it PV. Um, and then finally a dermatologist took a biopsy and it came back positive. Um, by that point, we also found out I was pregnant. Um, I went to back to the rheumatologist and she said, I have to start methotrexate because that's all she knew and um, steroids. Uh, by this point, it was, it started in my mouth. It was all over my mouth. I couldn't eat. It went down my esophagus. It was like closing up. I couldn't barely breathe. And then um, it was all over my body and my uh, armpits, like luckily it never went inside my genitals, but it was definitely all over my body and it was horrible and painful. Um, I ended up losing the baby and, but I also ended up finding Dr. Grando and he said, do not take the methotrexate. He started me with 150 milligrams of prednisone and um, we applied for the rituxan and IVIG. The prednisone was the worst experience of my life. I'm not going to say it's worse than the disease because that was pretty brutal, but I went from 130 pounds up to 160 pounds and I walked every day. So it just was crazy. My uh, blood pressure was skyrocketed. Um, I lost my hair. Um, not all of it because I'm Italian, but a lot of it, it was I wish there was something to do besides prednisone because that was very hard to go through. Um, once we started the rituxan, I did 10 rounds of rituxan and that I didn't really have too many side effects from that. Uh, I do IVIG every month and now tapering down to every other month. I am now in remission. So it worked the rituxan and IVIG. Um, but uh, the prednisone was absolutely awful, and I wish there was something besides the prednisone that you could do. Um, also, uh, you know, it's a long journey, I get it, but I've heard of like experiments over in Europe with certain things that can help uh, put you into remission right away. It's been a year, I'm in remission, thank God. Um, the worst side effects were from the prednisone, uh, but other than that, I am grateful for Dr. Grando and grateful for the community to help. Um, and so I'm here to help if anyone needs any more questions. Hi, I'm Andrea Liu. I'm a pemphigus foliaceous patient, and I'm also the Hepburn Professor for Physics and um, Director of the Center for Soft and Living Matter at the University of Pennsylvania. So I developed the first symptoms of pemphigus foliaceus in April of 2017. At that point, I was misdiagnosed as having eczema. Uh, I was given oral steroids because it's quite severe, but oral steroids actually for me have the terrible side effect that it makes it very difficult to sleep. And that actually led to very rapid progression of the disease. I was finally correctly diagnosed in August of 2017. At that point, my doctor prescribed rituximab therapy, but the FDA has not approved rituximab for treatment of pemphigus foliaceus because it is such a rare disease. 
and there have not been clinical trials for it. As a result, my insurance company turned it down. I have top of the line health insurance to the University of Pennsylvania, and yet it took five weeks to get insurance therapy, insurance approval for the therapy. Those five weeks almost killed me. By the time I had it, got it, uh, I had a border 800 lesions all over my body. So rituximab therapy was effective, uh, but it has the unfortunate side effect, right, of killing off your CD19 and 20 active B cells, making it very difficult to develop immunity to new pathogens. In today's environment with COVID and so forth, that is actually quite dangerous. Um, so we need more specific therapies, such as CAR T cell therapy. My doctor, Amy Payne at the University of uh, Pennsylvania is now working on CAR T cell therapy for pemphigus vulgaris. Um, it shows a lot of promise, and I hope eventually that research will be done for pemphigus foliaceus as well. Um, in addition, more research needs to be done into diet. It turns out gluten is a huge trigger for me. Um, and the fasting mimicking diet um, is undergoing clinical trials for other autoimmune diseases, such as multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. I hope that eventually the FDA will um, provide approval um, for pemphigus foliaceus um, for other therapies that, are, uh, that have far fewer side effects so that patients like me have a much better shot at survival. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Noble. I live on the south coast of England. I've had mucous membrane pemphigoid since I was age 36. For me in the beginning, it was quite aggressive. I was put on the, the usual cocktail of drugs. I had cyclophosphamide, um, dapsone, doxycyclone. I had large doses of steroids. I was on steroids for uh, over four years. Um, the game changer I had my first two infusions of rituximab in um, late 2006 and that went some way to calming the disease progression. Um, since then I've had over 30 operations on my eyes and my airway. Uh, I had an operation a few years ago to uh, unfuse my epiglottis that was uh, sealing my windpipe shut and restricting my breathing. Um, I've been to accident and emergency at least 200 times since then and I still even now, despite all of the operations, still have to go every few weeks once the pain uh, is unbearable for some, uh, for some treatment. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day life, I, I'm registered as blind. Um, the MMP took my sight, all of my sight in my left eye within six months of my first blister uh, in my right eye. I've got cataracts from the steroids, uh, secondary glaucoma. Um, there's quite heavy scarring on, uh, on my cornea. So my vision even in that eye is really uh, quite poor. So in, in terms of my day-to-day -day life, it's obviously taken my independence quite a lot. I, I, I live my life as most visually impaired people would. Um, you know, I don't go out very much. Uh, certainly in my case, I. I avoid going out if the weather's extreme. I don't like the wind. Um, air conditioning is not very great for me. Uh, I can't see anything at night. Um, so that's all quite restrictive. Uh, I had to give up my um, career in IT, um, but on the plus side, my my use uh, my love of technology means that, um, you know, the assistive technology helps my life day to day and, and that's a real plus. But really everything I do from day to day is around managing my airway through the use of a nebulizer, um, keeping my airway clear and, and lubricating my eyes. Um, I, I still have to use eye drops every few minutes. Uh, I rarely sleep more than a couple of hours without waking up to, uh, to hydrate them as well. Um, but there's a chasm of difference between not being able to see anything at all and, um, and you know, having rubbish eyesight. So I persevere and hope that the, uh, the science comes along with a, a miracle cure. Thanks a lot. Greetings all. My name is Jody Farron and I have PV. This is my video number two. Fast forward to 2009 when I have necessitated by a move to Michigan 
changed practitioners to Dr. David Paul Fivenson. Hi, Dr. Five. And I come to Dr. Fivenson basically on 180 milligrams per day of prednisone, 200 milligrams twice a day of Dapsone, and an unknown amount of Celsept. Continually getting sicker and sicker despite all of the medication. The medication has, uh, the prednisone in particular, has caused me to need uh, very early double cataract surgery for subcapsular cataracts, uh, changed me musculoskeletally, and uh, I developed prednisone psychosis. Additionally, the amount of Dapsone I was taking has caused uh, permanent peripheral neuropathy in parts of my feet. So, and I don't know what the Celsep did. Um, I know Imuran, a short course of that, gave me smoldering liver failure. So either way, these medications are not well tolerated. I, through Dr. Fivenson, signed up for a double-blind clinical trial. And unfortunately, being a double-blind study, you either get the medication, the study drug, or you don't. I did not. And I continued to get sicker and sicker. My scalp was a mass of scabby sores. I had to cut my hair. And that was a terrible, terrible mental strain on me. Uh, additionally, um, I had developed cutaneous symptoms at that time where prior to um, uh, the clinical trial, I was only um, really seeing the worst in the mu mucous membranes, but nonetheless, they were terrible. Uh, then Dr. Fivenson attended a conference in England where uh, he learned that a first line of defense for PV over across the pond is infusions of rituximab. Uh, he came home, signed me up through St. Joseph uh, Medical Center in Canton, Michigan. I received uh, a number of treatments and I have now been in remission for almost seven years. Thank you. Thank you to all of our wonderful speakers who sent in a video for uh, us to, to view. Uh, those are some pretty powerful stories and we appreciate you sharing your impact 